Hi, I'm John Silvey, and this is Art and Design. Today, my guest is Gene Gentleman. Thanks for coming on the show, Gene. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, almost thought we were going to have snow today, but <laughs> you know, we, I drove uh, out of Traverse City in a little snow, and uh, uh, they had a lot more up there. The day is so, young. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Gene, um, I want to. I want to. We've we've got some notes mm -hmm. of of your life story. Mm -hmm. And I want you to just start at the beginning for us. Yeah, yeah I have to have notes because uh, otherwise I'm be saying, I'll think of it in a minute <laughs> <laughs> at this age in my life. Um, my story in, in, I've had a golden career. I, I, when I think back upon it now, uh, the 48 years that I was in the museum world, uh, I have very few regrets, one big one, uh, but it's been wonderful. Uh, and it, it starts, um, actually it sort of starts when I was in high school. Uh, uh, my senior high school English teacher, second semester, Miss Fleischauer, uh, who wasn't hard to pay attention to, she was young and blonde and all of the boys paid attention this big to her. regret that you referred to earlier no 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 okay just no, checking. no no but she she showed us her her slides of having backpacked through europe she had just come back in the queen mary and that was a revelation to a farm kid who grew up on a dairy farm and the life experience was as far as you could go on a sunday after mm -hmm after church and milking the cows and how far you could drive away and then come back to milk the cows again in the evening. And that was my life experience, the radius of it. And so that planted a seed for me. Uh, then when I uh, uh, went to the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, it was Wisconsin State University at, uh, at the time. And uh, my high school speech teacher, Mrs. Kloss, had told me that they had a planetarium at the at, uh, Wisconsin State University in Eau Claire, and I was interested in astronomy, and so that sort of set the course as to where I was going to go and, and why. And I uh, went to the university, and my freshman semester, I took descriptive astronomy with Bob Elliott, who was the astronomy professor, and I went up to him after class one day and I said, I want to run the planetarium. I want to be a student worker in the planetarium. And he said, okay, and he took me down one day and showed me the operation of the instrument and, and so on. And uh, for people who don't know what a planetarium it is, it's a projector that shows the sky and the motion of the planets and so on. It's a, uh, now it's all digital, but back then it was a mechanical, it was a machine. And, and so he did that, and I did some practicing and so on. And then one day after class again, he walked up to me and he said, he handed me the keys to the planetarium. He said, there's a scout group down there that needs a show. And so I got my baptism by fire that way. I didn't have to worry about it, you know, fret for days. And I went down, did the show, and I ran the planetarium as a student worker for Bob my whole four years at the university. And two weeks before I was to graduate, I walked into his office to get my assignment for lectures to give to school groups that were coming in and so on. And he handed me a plane ticket to Alpena, Michigan. I'd never been on a plane in my life. I didn't know where Alpena was. And he said, here, you're going to interview to run the planetarium at the Besser Museum in Alpena. I had been interviewing uh, for high school teaching jobs. I thought, I'll teach high school science. And back then, they were putting planetariums into uh, uh, high schools You know, when we were beating the Russians to the moon in those days. And so two days after I graduated, I got on the old North Central Blue Goose. Uh, and flew to Alpena, uh, was picked up at the airport, uh, interviewed that evening, interviewed the next morning, and at noon they hired me and I had achieved my career goal of 
having a planetarium to operate, and I was in the museum world, which I knew nothing about. So uh, <laughs> that's how it begins. And I ran the planetarium for the first year that I was there, but my college roommate, uh, Dave Van Curen, uh, he's uh, gone now, uh, he, his mother was a war bride from England uh, from the war, and he wanted to go back to uh, England to see his family uh, and backpack through Europe. Uh, but he was a year behind me, so I go and I work in Alpena, and the summer comes, and I have to now take this backpacking trip with Dave. And I told them, I need the summer off or I have to quit because I have to do this with my roommate, I promised. They gave me the summer off. And uh, we got on the old uh, or BOAC out of Chicago and flew to London. Uh, I had $1,400 in cash in my pocket. And uh, we walked around London for the day. We got into Heathrow early in the morning, walked around London for the day. And in the evening, we uh, went out to uh, Shaftesbury, where his uncle and his grandmother lived. And that evening, his uncle, who had a friend, and the two of them owned a Rolls Royce together, and they took us pub crawling in that Rolls Royce. So that was my first experience traveling in Europe. That's not backpacking. And no, well, it, it didn't stay that good <laughs> all along. Well, the... The bottom line of that trip, for seven weeks, I traveled to Europe and saw great museums and the big cities in Paris and so on. And I came back to Alpina, uh, to the Besser, and at that time, uh, the exhibitions they were showing in the Besser were primarily what I would call amateurs, Sunday afternoon painters, local artists, and so on. And I had... I was aware of the fact that what they were showing was not what I had experienced, uh, certainly not what I experienced in Europe, but that was at a different, entirely different level. But when I was at the university, uh, uh, I met whom would become my wife eventually, Marcia, and she was in the art department doing studio art. And so I spent a lot of time in the art department, uh, and I would get in the art galleries of the, and they would bring in exhibitions from different places, and and what they were showing was not what I was seeing, or I saw at the, at the Besser, at that time. And so after I got back from Europe, uh, I decided this has got to change. And so in 1973, when nobody wanted to go to Detroit. I drove to Detroit uh, and uh, started looking for the commercial art galleries. And in the process of that, I met Bob Gorelick, who was then uh, president of the Detroit Art Dealers Association, Dada. And he sort of took me under his wings and introduced me to the various galleries in Birmingham and, and downtown Lester and Kitty Arwen and Gertrude Castle at the Fisher Building. And, and up in Birmingham, uh, Donald and Florence Morris, who became great friends and supporters uh, of my efforts, and Tim Hill, and Jim and Nancy Yaw, uh, Corrine Lemberg, and, and, and Cantor, uh, Claire Cantor, I think, um, and Alice Simsar in Ann Arbor, uh, who I love dearly, uh, and Habitat Galleries, Ferd Hampson and Tom Boone, uh, who at the time were just getting into the contemporary studio glass movement, but were selling prints and other things. And so getting to know these people and their galleries, what I discovered was is that they had inventory in the back rooms. Now remember, this is, I'm naive, totally naive about all of this. And I just asked them, can I borrow works from the back rooms and take it to Alpina and do exhibitions? And they let me do that. And for 10 years, I 
organized exhibitions for the best are out of the back rooms of the commercial galleries in Detroit. And in the course, met individual artists and invited individual artists to exhibit and so on. Uh, and so my emergence as an art curator uh, really comes from that background. I have one art appreciation class and one music appreciation class at university and a whole lot of physics and chemistry. So, But if you don't ask, you don't get anything. Then you if, asked. If you don't ask, you know. So, <laughs> so um, one of the more interesting stories that comes around uh, again, uh, we started doing some traveling exhibitions and, and Pace Galleries in New York was sending around an exhibition of Louise Nevelson prints and some cast multiples that she was doing at the time. And Louise Nevelson is an artist whose work I love and my wife also. And, and uh, so I booked this exhibition and I uh, thought, the Detroit Institute of Arts has a huge Nevelson spread out. It's, uh, I've always seen it curved at the, at the DIA, and it's somewhere approaching 40 feet long. And so I wrote a letter to Fred Cummings, and I said, could I borrow this for our exhibition? And well, I got a nice letter back from Fred a few weeks later saying, we're very sorry, but we can't, you know, make this loan. And of course, I realized years later as I knew more about all of this that that was a really ridiculous thing to ask for, but, you know. So, um, uh, I went on and, as I said, you know, I, I self-made curator in that regard. Uh, one of the... Uh, great joys of working with all of these people uh, was working with Ferdinand Hampson and Tom Boone at Habitat. Uh, they, uh, uh, we got into, when they got heavily into contemporary studio glass, uh, uh, we eventually proposed an exhibition to the Detroit Institute of Arts, which then had, and, and again now has, uh, a statewide services program where they sent exhibitions to the museums around the state. And we proposed an exhibition uh, of the emerging artist in contemporary studio glass, uh, which they did. Uh, in 1983, uh, Glass Artists and Influence uh, toured with the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, the DIA has always been uh, sort of a, uh, an important part of my professional life in, in that they gave me some pretty unique opportunities. and. Uh, uh, to work with them uh, and, you know, to do some exciting things. So uh, that sort of was the better uh, part of my life and the transition, if you will, from uh, planetarium work, although I became president of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association and continued in that effort and and I'm organizing exhibitions under the title of planetarium coordinator <laughs> at the Besser, or um, that eventually changed to assistant director. But anyway, uh, uh, in 1984, it, it was time to make a transition. Uh, if I was going to get a directorship, you have to move up in the museum world uh, by moving on. Uh, and so I took a job in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, as director of the Erie Museum Authority for a, a historical museum and a historic house that had a planetarium in the carriage house uh, of, of, the, uh, of this uh, complex. And I went there because they were proposing to uh, redo the flagship Niagara from the Battle of Lake Erie, the Commodore Perry, the War of 1812, all of this. And, and the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Historical Commission had this ship. And the head of the board of the museum I operated 
uh, had this vision. Uh, in Erie, Pennsylvania is where Lytton Shipyards built the thousand foot lake freighters that move across the lakes and carry iron ore and so on. And they had a huge building with a water berth and they would uh, build these sections of these uh, freighters and then float them out from this water berth out and then build the next section and float it out and connect them together, however they did that. And the idea was that they would restore the flagship Niagara and then float it inside this water berth in this building that was no longer used. And it was kind of a ship in the bottle, if you will, and then have a historic center and a reinterpretation of all of this. And, and so I spent uh, the better part of four years working with architects and uh, economics research in Chicago and places, sort of looking at the feasibility of making this happen. Uh, well, when all the numbers came back, it was a $20 million project and, you know, probably out of scale for Erie, Pennsylvania, even though, you know, surrounded by Buffalo and Cleveland and Pittsburgh. And, uh, and it became clear to me that this is not going to probably happen in uh, a reasonable time within my directorship my career, career, uh, career uh, to want to hang out for it. Uh, and I thought there was a better opportunity. Uh, there was a, a modern tool building downtown that was close to, right next to the art museum and the historical society. And I thought that what Erie needed was a hands-on museum uh, hands-on science museum and this building afforded the opportunity to do that and have a cultural center all in one complex, uh, one city block, if you will. And at that time they were tra traveling these dinosaurs, the mechanical dinosaurs around and, and uh, uh, they were coming to Cleveland and so I arranged for the dinosaurs without telling my board uh, to come to Erie, Pennsylvania, and put them in the modern tool building with the idea that this would demonstrate the, this potential. Well, it was a huge success. I mean, dinosaurs, you know. Uh, uh, and so I made the proposal to the city fathers and business people and so on. But at that point, I was already interviewing uh, or applying for other directorships. And uh, one day, in the, Ameri uh, the American Association of Museums Adviso uh, was a listing of job openings, and uh, there was uh, the opportunity. Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City was going to be building an art museum, and they wanted to hire someone to carry out the process. And they were looking for a master's in art history, and I had a bachelor's in physics, and I thought I didn't have a snowball's chance in hell. But I threw my hat in the ring on the last day, and much to my surprise, got an interview. And much to my surprise, uh, a few weeks later, was called back, and even more shockingly, they hired me. Uh, and I'm clearly, I'm, my work in Erie, on uh, museum development and so on, I'm sure factored into that probably more than the masters in art history. And so I had the opportunity to create my own museum. I say my own museum, obviously, but from my perspective, uh, to take the designs that already existed and modify them where I thought was necessary and so on, because they wanted to have a director before they put a shovel in the ground. They wanted you know, to have that professional uh, consultation, which is very forward thinking that doesn't always happen. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we got a much better facility out of it. Uh, but uh, in the process, a uh, few interesting things uh, happened along the way. Um, I brought in Marianne Wilkinson, who was then uh, involved with the Statewide Services Program. And, to make sure that we were designing it the way that the DIA could never say no to us for an exhibition. Uh, one of the things that had uh, the 
Northwestern Michigan College uh, in 1960, Bernie Rink, who was the director of the library, uh, had started a collection of Inuit art, art of the Canadian Arctic, uh, uh, stone sculptures and prints from the Inuit peoples. And this came about <clears throat> because of a connection uh, with Wilbur Monarchy, who was on the board of Eskimoar Incorporated in Ann Arbor uh, uh, that was started by Eugene Power from Power Center at the, and Ann Arbor and so on. And uh, Eugene Power had met Jim Houston, who is the artist who brought all of this or sort of started all of this in the Arctic with the Inuit peoples. And uh, so Monarchy, knowing Bernie, Bernie, uh, he gave Bernie a collection of sculpture and the first set of prints from Cape Dorset to sell on the college campus as a little fundraiser for the college and for the Humane Society uh, in Traverse City. And Bernie fell in love with this art and he used some of the proceeds to buy some pieces. And over the next decade, started building this collection of sculpture and prints by these artists from the Canadian Arctic. And when I came, this was the major art collection for Northwestern Michigan College. Uh, the president at the time, who was not the president who hired me, and he came up to me one day, he says, you're not going to put that in the museum, are you? And, I looked at him, I said, well, this is your collection. And uh, yes, of course, we were going to put it in the museum. Uh, and I had the good fortune uh, at that time to uh, looking in the back of a book on Inuit art that was in the library. I found the name Mame Jackson uh, from here. She was a professor at Wayne State, or retired now as a professor at Wayne State. At that time, she was at the University of Michigan, and she worked with Eugene Power. Uh, on Inuit art, but, and she had her doctorate in Baker Lake imagery. And so I contacted Mame uh, and brought her up and I said, you know, what do I do with this? And, uh, uh, and she was all for putting it in the museum too and we created a whole gallery just devoted to that collection. And it has become the largest collection in the United States now of uh, contemporary Inuit art. Uh, right now, it's probably approaching somewhere between 16 and 1800 works, probably closer to 1800 works now. And in the end, it's what gave the Denos an international reputation that we would have never had otherwise. You know, we would have been a nice museum, nice regional museum. But that collection made us noteworthy in a way that nothing else was going to. The other thing that happened was the state of Michigan uh, gave $500,000 to uh, name what was then uh, was kind of an auditorium, but it was more of a lecture hall auditorium uh, in honor of Bill and Helen Milliken. And in the original plans, it was 150 seats. And then there was a committee that had traveled around to visiting other museums in the Great Lakes area. And it was recommended by the director at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, that they should make it 250 seats, which they did. But they never repriced the building based on that. Well, they're going to, when I got there, uh, two weeks after I arrived uh, in August of 88, uh, they were going to have, they were having a tribute to honor Bill and Helen Milliken and to raise more money for the project. And the brochure said 350 seats. I don't know if it's a typo or not, but anyway, there wasn't the right communication between the prints for the plans for the building and the brochure. And so, I said, which is it? And well, you can't back off of 350 seats now that you published it and you're honoring the people whose name is on the building or on the auditorium. So I said, well, then you better put a bigger stage in front of this than a you know, little recital stage uh, and for that many seats. 
So that's how Mellican Auditorium became Mellican Auditorium <laughs> as it is now. <laughs> Started with the typo. <laughs> in the, you know, whether it was a typo or not. Uh, but it was, a, it was the best thing that could have happened in terms of uh, uh, the facility. It cost a million dollars more, uh, but I was already doing other things that was going to make the building cost more money, but that's why I was hired, I guess, probably not to do that, but that's what happened. But it's a great space. But it, it became uh, a much better facility. Uh, and the other thing uh, I thought about, when I drove into Traverse City uh, at that time, my sons uh, were you know, elementary school age, and I said, what's going to bring people from the community and around to an art museum on a college campus? You know, the museums on college campuses can be a little off-putting, or they're hard to find, uh, and, you know, and the public is not as comfortable sometimes going on to college campuses. And, and so when I was in... Uh, 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 Erie, Pennsylvania, I attended a session on the use of computers in museums at the High Museum in uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And they had a hands-on interactive space related to the arts. Uh, and I was quite impressed with that and I thought, we need that in this new museum. And that became what is the Discovery Gallery. If you go to the museum now, it's gone through some transitions and more being planned by the new director, uh, which is good. Those things should happen uh, over time. And so uh, the end product of what becomes the Denos uh, uh, is a result of a brochure <laughs> <laughs> and a visit to the high and other things. Uh, but uh, we created, uh, I think, Bob Holderman was the architect on the project, and he did a wonderful job creating a, a beautiful facility uh, for the community, and one very functional. Uh, it's worked over and over again uh, as exhibitions have come through uh, uh, the building. Uh, while we were waiting to have, I came in 88, the building opened in 91, so there's this time when we're building and you got to have something else to do. Uh, there was a, uh, a funding that came through the state to put public art in on campuses uh, near buildings and so on. And I applied for this funding uh, to put start what became a public art collection on the campus. And in the end, we commissioned Marsha Wood from Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo to do the first piece on the campus. Uh, the artist who was the runner-up was Hannah Stiebel uh, uh, from uh, this area. And uh, when the Denos was about to open, we had a big plaza out front, and uh, Hannah uh, offered us a piece that she had put in a public art uh, uh, exhibition that was done in Birmingham at the town uh, city offices and so on in the plaza. So we brought that up, put it in front of the museum, and collector bought it within a week. And so I was much relieved that both Marcia and Hannah now had pieces on the campus. But that went on to build a collection. There's about 14 works now. Uh, the most significant being a piece by uh, Clement Meadmore, the uh, Australian sculptor uh, that was facilitated by Donald and Florence Morris, uh, who represented him, and put a really major work on our campus and uh, in the community. Uh, the donor for that uh, uh, piece was Joanne Zimmerman, and it turns out that Florence Morris and Joanne were schoolmates in Traverse City. See how convenient that is? <laughs> so, you know, so Gene, it was a fun at, story. at this point, um, we're going to have you back. Okay. And I appreciate this quick overview, and yeah. we're going to do a part two coming up. Okay. <laughs>